So what happens, you know, when we get stuck in that amygdala, in that systems one thinking, we can use the example of when I was 16, I, a week after I got my driver's license, I was driving in the rain and a car spun out going in the opposite direction and hit my car. And so for decades, I would go and get in the, whenever it rained, I didn't want to drive. And so the way I look at that from a brain perspective is that my amygdala sense had a story that driving in the rain is dangerous. And I think there's so many of us who carry those stories around and then we see this situation and it starts to trigger the amygdala to keep you safe. So in that moment, when you're being triggered, knowing you're being triggered, it, how do we move ourselves to systems two thinking so that we don't just keep operating from that amygdala. Well, the event that occurred initially that you assumed had more drawbacks and benefits and it will be stored. See, the amygdala adds yeah. valency to experiences and sends those imbalanced perspectives over to the hippocampus to be stored as a memory. And then our subconscious mind is the accumulation yeah. of those imbalanced memories to protect us from the instincts yeah. and right. seek the prey, the, the prey and predator game. So the subconscious mind stores all conscious, unconscious splits from the past that have never been balanced and be fully conscious. So in that moment, you're going to react because systems one is larger diameter neurons and they fire much faster than systems two. And so you're going to react first. Unless you go back with a preemptive strike and a foresight to go back to that original event. And in that moment that you were in the rain, that you stored an assumption that there were more drawbacks and benefits. If we go in there and find out what were the benefits of that, where were the opposites of that, which were there, but you oversighted them. You were unconscious of them. But if I made you fully conscious, which is what I do in the breakthrough experience and doing with a demarcation method, if I made you fully conscious of them, um, you would no longer have that stored as a subconsciously stored, you know, danger. You would have it as an already balanced situation. You just drive and it's rain and then go about your business because yes, you'd be conscious that mm -hmm. there's, there's, that you need to be cautious. I mean, because you're rain, driving in rain is oil on your tires and on the street, make it more slick. and da, da, da. So you're not going to be foolish, but you're not going to react from previous stored subconsciously stored baggage. So you can go back to that moment. I do it every weekend in the breakthrough experience with the method, the martini method. I do that every week and I take so-called trauma. See, people think Think there's actually a trauma out there. There was never a trauma out there until you chose to make it by your associations you made with it. If I came and I took your, let's imagine I grabbed your hand right here and put it on the desk and I took a hammer and slammed it all of a sudden and you, oh God. And you thought, my God, that's traumatic. The guy just traumatized me. Why did he do that? You would associate pain without pleasure in your mind. But if I told you I'm going to mm -hmm. give you a billion dollars cash, it's sitting right next to the desk where I'm slamming it. It's a billion dollars cash. It's yours. Plus a new car, plus a new house and any of the things that you might fantasize about. I'm just making those up. But if I put enough advantages on there, you would actually put your thumb out there. And if I told you this would be repaired in 10 days and it's a temporary 10 day aggravation for all of that, it wouldn't be traumatic unless you've chosen. Anaxagoras, 2,500 and something years ago, described that pain and pleasure are perceptions. Pain is an actual appreciation, its role, but these are associations we make and we can change them. And people don't believe that. And they want to blame the outside event and blame the individual with a false attribution bias instead of take command of their reality. You know what? This reminds me, uh, like where my brain goes with that is, well, what about the horrible things that happen to people like, you know, rape or, you know, something that's really traumatic that has happened to them? Is perception. 1,300 rape cases through that process and had them no longer in anxiety, fear, resentment, et cetera, over that event. See, to let that run your life the rest of your life to me is, is crazy. I'm not denying that this, horrible. I'm not denying that the individual did these actions, but when you break rape down, it goes into threat, constraint, deception, violation, injury. You know, it's broken down into subcomponents. And what we do is we then go and ask, where do we do those things? And I've done 1300 cases of it. I haven't found anyone that just broken it down and didn't find where they've done that. And they couldn't find where the other sides are, the upsides to it. And you think, well, that's terrible. No, it isn't. You choose to make it so. You can turn that into a great gift. I have a right now that's traveling the world doing amazing things as a best-selling author and started out with that event and we transformed it into how we could use that to do something extraordinary with her life so 
instead of staying a victim of history, she became a master of destiny and saw it on the way instead of in the way. And so it's the association we make with it. I'm not denying that that occurred, but we make it trauma. What we did is that, yes, they did constrain us. Now the question is, what are we going to perceive? What are we going to do with that? We have control over our perceptions, decisions, and actions over that event. So we can stay stuck and run our story for the rest of our life, or we can transform the story and get on with doing something amazing with it, use it to catalyze something extraordinary.